And are you actually a CEO? It is okay to not have that as a title because you know there is a lot more to it than just, oh, I'm the boss, so I, I am also the CEO. Hey everybody, welcome to Stay Sharp. I'm Jordan Ray and this is Rashad Tyler. So yeah, Stay Sharp is our series where we explore best practices and applications while we're on our creative approach towards entrepreneurship, a better life, yeah, more fun. Like where you kind of fused all those things in. Yeah. Makes a little bit more sense to me when you mention a creative approach anyway. Why Where are we that? going today, huh? Why Because that? that was, uh, well, the reason, you know, obviously that was a cold intro. Um, but what Jordan just did was she mentioned one of the working titles that we have for this program. And I didn't really realize that it was a part of a uh, descriptor, which is something that we do all the time. Like sometimes we have working titles and we're trying to find a way to kind of fuse or make the ideas, the initial idea a part of or, or um, take that first idea and push it into the description line of the final idea. Um, not because we are making sure it's there, but it sometimes is the start place. We're just kind of describing what the idea is directionally and then the better title seems to come later. The cooler title. Sure, sure. You want to take it from there or? No, nah, I mean, I don't know where to take it. I, I, like we talked about before we turned the cameras on, like I figured you might have somewhere you wanted to, to, to go or something that you wanted to discuss, or just like a general prompt for uh, what we should talk about. Yeah, I think I'm trying to talk about the top things that a CEO should know. Mm. And we can even break down CEO and what that really means, hmm. um, what that might be confused with sometimes, what the responsibilities are that come along with being a CEO, or is that even your the right title? <laughs> um, so you and I have had a, a, a lot of conversation about this, you know, just like that. Um, and you can see like the, I'm sure I'm car carrying that uh, Cheshire cat grin about it, but y'all ain't CEOs, man. Most, you know, a CEO <laughs> is um, in effect, the person who is responsible for managing the company, but it's only applicable when the company structure warrants it. Meaning you have a, an executive board. Right. You have uh, assigned- an executive officer. Correct. You have an executive board. <laughs> and so don't be calling yourself a CEO if you ain't got- you If know, you don't have a board. Because it's not that you aren't the boss. Right. Or that you aren't calling the shots. Because it's not about being a, a, a boss, like whoever, being a founder is plenty. Being an owner is plenty of a description. Um, right. What you actually do from a function standpoint is what your title ultimately should represent. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the standard way that your um, uh, companies are founded uh, via most states, uh, the way that you sign up, um, you kind of register your company with an individual state wherever your company's uh, active at or, or founded at. It'll ask for a title and usually the title is president. The assumption is that you have a basic, you know, structure, which is president, vice president, you know, vice president of this, treasury, secretary. treasurer and secretary. Correct. Executive, chief executive officer, again, is when you have those roles, but you have an executive board that that person reports to. And then structurally it makes sense. But, you know, so I don't want to offend way. anybody with it because yeah. some of my closest friends call themselves CEO and I just go, okay, you don't even know 
anything of the first thing about structuring a company right. you you might make money as a thing which is not necessarily contradictory you know like you can be both financially successful and not have structure <laughs> like it's not right. you know what i'm saying it's not necessary but if you were going to build a company that had a chance to ipo and all of those different things you're going to need certain structures and certain checks and balances in order to meet the requirements of being a publicly offered company, which is an entirely different thing. Right, so pause real quick. I totally get what you're saying. <laughs> I do think that there are buzzwords that, you know, we catch on to Correct. via social media or the things that we're reading or the TV shows that we're watching and we, you know, kind of get attached to these buzzwords. Right. And CEO, that acronym has become something that has not actually been fully understood because we can tell by the way some of us are using it and it is not to call anybody out but it's just it's literally just a conversation we're just dissecting okay what does ceo really mean right and are you actually a ceo it is okay to not have that as a title because you know there is a lot more to it than just oh i'm the boss so i i am also the ceo right and so you might like you said earlier you might be a founder or an owner right a co-founder you might have another um working acronym or something like that like you might be a something strategist or right. a something designer or something artist visual artist you know whatever that might look like but ceo may not be the actual proper working title but that's not to say that we can't just use it right now as a buzzword right and talk about all the things you should know as a ceo and i think sometimes in terms of both function and aspiration it's useful so when you think like you know i want to be like um, in our culture, I want to be like Diddy, and Diddy's the CEO of that, you know, and that's how it was presented to you. Right. Well, I get that. Yes. As a, you know, I want to be that level of an entrepreneur or a boss or an achiever. Right. And it's totally not wrong. Even if right. you still want Even to call though, yourself a CEO, correct. And you now know that, oh, CEO means that I have, a, you know, a team or a board or I, there is things right. that I, you know, there's other people that are in my organization that I oversee and that's what makes me a CEO right even if you still want to call yourself a CEO like literally don't even care like don't even mind us yeah so with <laughs> either you're gonna do something or you ain't you know you can call yourself you know the like a, a I've seen CFO be chief funny officer it's just a title right either you're gonna bust a grape or you're not either you what you're gonna bust a grape or you ain't. <laughs> Buzz a great. Oh, you ain't. <laughs> All right. So what are what are some of the first things that come to mind? Maybe one or two things that you think, for lack of a better term right now, mm -hmm. that every CEO, someone who is running a business, someone who is in charge of a team, or, yeah. may, you know, it might be solo entrepreneurship, it might be co-founders. What is like one or two things that come to mind? You're like, you have to know this about your business, about other businesses, about your market, you have to know this. I mean, there's a lot. I know there's a lot, but what's yeah. like something that comes to mind first? The very first thing is, is really understanding the opportunity and the marketplace that you want to go into. And when I'm saying, cause, it, cause you, it, if, if that can be one thing, that is the one thing because the sub parts of that or the component parts of that is understanding where or if you have a competitive advantage in, in, in said space. And secondly, understanding what the room, what type of room there may be for you in the said space and how big is the said space? Sure, so when I hear what you're saying, I think of first problem solution. What problem do right. I solve for said space? Right. And what is the solution that I'm giving right. to that said space? Right. So that's what that's kind of how you're thinking about it. And then also, in addition to problem solution, clearly knowing what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we can we can kind of talk about an example in a, in, a, in a second. But that problem solution, and then beyond that, knowing who, not just your target audience is, but who your competitors are. Right like knowing like not guessing or not thinking oh i don't have no competitors because what i'm doing is so different like you right. have a competitor there is something out there it might be a it might not even be a company or a 
it might be a tech device right. that is your competitor. Right. Um, the, 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 one of the more popular ways that it's referred to is product market fit. Really? So you think about how your product fits into the market, fits into the market <laughs> right? Or, or, or vice versa, right? Like if your product um, has interplay or coverage in multiple markets, then that has its own effect and its own value. Sure. You know, so it's like doing the work to understand what that means, where you sit and what the value is that, you know, you may or may not bring. And again, like, if you're going into a market space where uh, all of the action is at the top, then you have to be able to qualify and understand where you need to be in order to get some of the action. Mm -hmm. So in one of the books that uh, both of you and I have read, I'm pretty sure you read it, or maybe you haven't. Did you finish? I have read it. Ha uh, <laughs> good to great? I have read it. Okay. So... Uh, there's a book by Jim Collins, a popular book. It's not hard to find, nor is it like particularly special um, to bring up. But there's a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins that uh, talks about um, how different companies have looked at spaces and decided whether or not they're going to even place, play ball in that particular market. Mm -hmm. And in this particular analogy, it's like the sub-market, meaning a specific city or... Um, uh, region or state or whatever it is yeah. and there was one analogy and I'm not even sure if I'm borrowing it from the right the right place but it was in reference to like a, 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 I want to say grocery stores and the idea was either they need to be number one or number two in the market or they're out and they, or they need to see a path to becoming number one or number two yeah right yeah. that's that's a concept that I've read several times um, in different things it's to position yourself this is you know this conversation can kind of go on and we can go deeper right. and deeper but to position yourself to be number one or number two because it's like those two spots in any market are really dominating you know so if there is you know coke that has what 60 to 70 percent of the market mm -hmm. then Pepsi has the other 20 percent so if you're not one or two, you're left to just kind of fight for whatever's left in that 10% right. margin, you know, of the market. Right. And especially if you're fighting for the, like, say you're fighting for 3% of a market that is um, a 200 billion cap market, then that's not a bad competition. Sure. Right. But if you get into a market or get into a competition where the, the, the cap, meaning the value of the total, the sum value of the, the, the marketplace has an estimate, right? So if you go to, let's say, uh, selling shoes in a specific city, there's only so many shoes that are going to be sold, period. And there's a way you can calculate that. You just go and say, and I'm guessing, uh, and it should be a reasonable guess, that um, if a market, there is uh, per market somewhere around... 50 to $75 per quarter is what we spend on shoes or something to that effect per, per cap. Right. And I'm just guessing. Just kind of work backwards from there. Right. And then you go, okay, well, it's 200,000 people. Or let's use round numbers, 100,000 people in that market. So that means that the, the possibility is 3 point whatever um, million, right? 3.5 or whatever, right? right? So then you go, okay, well, what is 5% of 3.5? And that is the space that you're possibly fighting for, right. right? And then you get more niche than that or niche than that in order to kind of define your spot. So you say, okay, well, I'm selling women's shoes. So then you divide that number in half and you get yeah. a clearer picture of okay. what the possible Product market fit. or what the market size could be. Yes. And then you have to figure out how to fit your particular product to the market and what it's asking and demanding. So right. of that set of shoes, how many of them are dress shoes? How many of them are sandals? How many of them are sneakers? Yeah, so that's only the first thing that you <laughs> That's only but, the first thing that came to Rashad's mind that you need to know as a business owner. Or you shouldn't be playing or, ball. Like yeah, you, just you because you new. want to play doesn't mean that you should be playing. You definitely need to understand your 
problem that you're solving for people? Why are they going to actually buy your stuff? You need to understand the solution. This is how we right. make your life easier. This right. is how we make you look cooler. This is how we help you get this done faster or whatever that looks like. And then understanding the market around you and how things are moving, what are the trends, how everything is operating around you. One of the things I think that a CEO should know mm. is your hard business expenses. Like mm. how, like truly over the course of a month, a quarter, you know, six months, a year, truly how much investing or just just business, not even investing, but business expenses are you going to have in order to right. get your product out there? Um, or not even, you know, it's this is anything from, okay, do I have a paid ad strategy to what's the annual cost of my website? I think that these are, some of these things are super overlooked. It's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to officially file my business with the state that I live in. I'm going to get my LLC, boom, I'm in business. But you have to really think that this is a, your business is a living and breathing thing. So right. it costs money every month to kind of keep going, to feed into it. Your email list is going to cost your supplies, your shipping supplies, your, you know, just like I said, your website or any other third parties that you're utilizing. Mm -hmm. So what are the necessary things that I really, really, really need? And how much is that going to cost me a month? Right. Some some businesses are operating off of a three or $400 expense a month. Some businesses need three or 4,000. Some businesses need... 30, you know, do you have employees? Like those are all things that it's like, yo, I'm going to have to really think about this. So when I get two or three months down the line and I've started my business, I'm not out of gas because mm. I didn't know how much it costs. Right. There's um, a lot there and that's a, that's a hell of a, a, a pathway in terms of conversation to kind of go down because there's, you have to know your numbers for sure, particularly that of expense. But you should also have some access to the thought process or the ways to be successful in certain businesses. So there are business types that you can go into that are profitable from day one, right? Then there are types of businesses that are losing money for five, six, seven years before they become massively sure. you know, profitable. I think Amazon may even still be losing money, right? I know for sure Uber is, mm -hmm. right? But the market cap or, or the, the value of the company because it's a publicly held company and there is a, a calculation for when and how they expect to be profitable that is a part of the financial strategy. Right. Right. And for that type of firm or for that type of venture, you need to have a lot of runway. If you don't have a lot of runway, obviously that's not a game that you're going to want to play. Or if the idea is, is good enough and big enough and sexy enough to enough players, then you have a way to write it down, share the idea and raise money in order to get that thing off the ground. Ding, ding, ding. So that brings us to the next thing. <laughs> all right, I'm keeping all these in my head. So in addition to knowing what your hard business expenses are, yeah. so that way you're not caught off guard or you're not like, ooh, a website costs. 200 some dollars a year, ooh, I'm good, or whatever those things might be, you have a solid idea of that, mark that down, put it in a spreadsheet, write it on a piece of paper, however you gotta keep track of it. But the next thing would be an actual business strategy. Hmm. Because an idea is great. Like, ideas can be plentiful, um, ideas can be super unique, but without the roadmap for it and the strategy, to, okay, how am I really gonna get this done? Yeah. So that way I'm busting grapes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gotta be busting grapes. Gotta be busting. Uh, we should have grapes on the next thing. So Why, not? Why not? Why <laughs> not? But knowing your business strategy, I think is, is crucial and something that is, the, the whole point of this conversation is to get more conversation going about the things that you really need to know in order to be sustainable, successful, right. scalable. Right. That's the goal that we have, I know, with um, our, cre our own, very own creative agency and the studying that we do to make our business better, to help the clients and the partners that we work with, the other businesses that we work with, the other businesses that we own. Right. And so it's one of those things where it's like, okay, strategy, what, what does this look like for real? Right, right. Um, how do you, how do you, yeah, I mean, how do you, yeah, I mean, how do you I think, think about, that was a great summary. well, let me, I guess we can go a little bit deeper with 
what strategy looks like where. possibly. So what a year ago? Mm, what okay. was what was your strategy a year ago for Rare Label, and how is that different from where you are now? Because some of those things you've accomplished. Right. So it's like okay, your strategy is going to evolve and change. Well, I, I knew at least for my role in our partnership. Uh, because I've been in business for myself for a long time in a lot of different play, in a lot of different ways, I knew a part of it was going to be um, being reliable as a partner for figuring out uh, how to be useful for you, given these were going to be first experiences in a lot in, in a lot of ways, and uh, also taking on the responsibility of doing the things that you may not know need to be done. Right. And I use that as an example in a different way than maybe what somebody listening would expect. You don't have to know everything about the business that you're going into. You just need to be around somebody who, or around a couple of people, or, or try to invite people into the sphere that can help you figure out where your um, blind spots are. And so because I'd had so much business experience, a lot of the blind spots I was aware of, and even what you've seen, like we're always going outside of our own bubble in order to find other trinkets, yeah, and other things that'll suggest or prompt us towards what's gonna help us be successful in the future. Because there were pivots starts, stops, decisions that needed to be made that we wouldn't have had the ability to make had I not had certain experiences and had you not had certain points of view. Right, for sure. And I could dial up a ton of examples around that, but namely there was a, a, a dead period um, after Essence Festival um, where it's, emotional to have a moment where you don't do what you want to do you have in your mind like this is going to go like this and then at the end of it, we're going to be celebrating it's going to be champagne da, da, da. and so you don't know who you are as business partners or even as a person until you get punched in the mouth right and i think you know the reason most times from an investor standpoint i'm looking for People who have been in a game before, who have been knocked down and had their asses kicked before in order to have conversations with them about resilience because it's easy to find lip service about that and not find that somebody actually has the ability to actually take a punch and recover from it. Right. So the, the, the gulf of things that were necessary in order to start Rare not only started with mentality and culture um, the clear prompt was, okay, there's talent here. There's a need that we see that we can kind of fill or, or, or a hole that we feel like we can service. And we leapt towards trying to build that. But we did not enter the market without, frankly, having other momentum sources in order to give us an edge. Like we already had working relationships and working things that were able to kind of like turn those properties over to Rare Label and allow Rare Label a better start than maybe somebody who was coming sure. out of the clear cold in order to try to start whatever it is that they're doing. No, absolutely. I think that's something that we did do really well. And I want to circle back to kind of what you said yeah. about, you know, just kind of being a partner that was able to catch up or cover the slack. Um, we can talk about that in a yeah. second, but yeah. with that, I think that is something that we did well with Rare was to position Rare label in a way that, you know, we did have prior relationships. There were mm -hmm. prior, or, you know, other businesses that were in the mix um, and, and leverage those, you know, just kind of as a, as a stepping stone. Um, and yes, not every business or every idea or every person has those same those exact same you know possibilities right but everybody does have a competitive advantage and that's something that you mentioned you know a couple notes ago right was your competitive advantage dissect that like what makes what really makes you different what is your point of difference um is a term that we kind of right. refer to but what really makes you different you different what's that competitive advantage and how are you going to apply that to who you're selling to who you're selling against you know who your competitors are 
but a layer that you put into being a you know part of your strategy for rare label early on was to be a partner that understood the investment that you were making yeah. and understand that you were going into business with someone me yes. that hadn't started a business before yeah and i am on my side real quick i'm forever lucky that this is the first business that i've started because it is fire for lack of a better term i'm just trying to make my point here <laughs> but it's the first business that i've started and because you've already started 10 15 20 businesses not to mention projects right like the projects that you've had within all of those businesses yeah, hundreds have given you so many advantages and you've been able to kind of hand down some of that information for me meanwhile i'm like you know just like doggy paddling like trying to figure all it out you know in a you know in a really quick amount of time so yeah, yeah. i mean what, big props to you for recognizing that and knowing that as a business owner starting a business this is my own personal strategy everybody's strategy is different because my strategy for a rare label wasn't yours no but we have to align those and they they end up becoming something well well two things the the, the first is th thank you for you know saying what you said and kind of giving you know uh, uh, a salute to what my contribution has been but the thing that you began to recognize and see if you're sitting in my shoes it's the ability to assess what things have worked what things have not worked and why and you began to try and look for teammates with certain attributes that would allow the highest probability of success so what I knew about you and the reason that we even met and even had a conversation was largely dependent on someone else, uh, Teron uh, Patterson, it was like, yo, like she, you, you and her would be great working together, right. right? And I'm like, I don't know if I just want to work with her, but you know, <laughs> that's a concealed idea. <laughs> um, but for me, I was not interested in, um, uh, just dating someone like that's not on the on the top of my priority list nor was like the creative thing I'm just canvassing for whatever the best path of relationship might look like for any person I run into right. I'm going okay well this could happen here yeah. and it just so happened you happen to be massively creative you happen to be massively uh, tough and determined and those are not common attributes you know, I, I walk around when I'm in the gym and I look at dudes or I, you know, and all the rest of that, I think of that Jay-Z lyric. And even though, you know, we don't have kids, I just think that, you know, my baby mama harder than a lot of you niggas. Yeah. And I think like, oh, that's the difference. I know what it is that we have between us that will create some separation because I know that you're going to do the thing that needs to be done. Right. Thank you. And that part in and of itself is a very concealed idea because a lot of people think that of their their other other half right and i know because i've been in the trenches with different types of people what strong tough kick-ass partnerships look like really, and really look like <laughs> yeah like and, and not comparing you to the strong kick-ass women that i've worked with the strong kick-ass people period and it just so happens that a large component of them, if not more than half, are women. Right. And so it's not uh, and was not a thing that I could lend to you um, uh, this need for you to be better than you were. So I'm telling you with full confidence, like, oh, you're as good as this person. And you're probably looking at me like, what? I haven't done anything just yet. Right. But the person I'm pointing to is at the top of field and I've worked with them. And I'm because I've worked with them when they were in the same or similar situation, right. you know, as an entrepreneur, as you were kind of walking into. I knew what they were made up of, made up with at the time. So I'm going, like, oh, man, you're better than they were at the time. But there's no way for you to know and most people to know that. And that that being a that being baked into your strategy is like that's crazy. 
and I know that yeah because I'm, I'm with you yeah. all the time but to hear that you know kind of broken down in that way um, and you're like yo this played out in my strategy like I knew yeah. who I was going into business with because of prior behavior just things that I had experienced yeah. in that way you're not setting yourself up no. by going into business with somebody that isn't going to show up um, so that being a part of your business strategy is well I mean ultimately I'm responsible to, to you as a partner first right so and we, we had this conversation I'm like yo if you stink at business like I still gotta feed you as the I need to eat. <laughs> or at least that's the you know primitive thought process that I have mm -hmm. about my role as a man in, in, in a relationship so I'm going like yo if you're not the best person to run this company then I got to kick you out because I got to take care of Jordan. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I got to bring somebody else in because you got to eat, right? But it so happens that, you know, at least in, 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 in our business, like, I get to follow behind your ideas and support running things because you are the only person that could have created this company. You know what I mean? And so, like, I'm able to sit in a very close passenger seat, do some clear out work or whatever, but it's mostly like following you as the as the lead, as the as the president of our of our company. It's easy for me to be confident because I sit as both a partner and an advisor. Yeah, no, I like it, um, and thank you. I think my strategy going into things was because it was my first business. I knew that it was going to be a fight. Like I knew that I was going to have to immerse myself because if you've learned anything at all. Like all of us have learned something. We've learned to play a sport. We've learned to play an instrument. We have learned, you know, a new job. Right. Maybe we've switched, switched careers, whatever that might be. So I knew part of my strategy was like, you have to show up every day because it is going to be difficult. Right. And it's going to be a learning curve. You're going to find that you're going to fail at a lot of things. And that's not something that I was or am used to. Right. You know, to right. be honest. And, yo, know, you got to pick yourself up and just kind of keep walking, keep learning, keep finding resources. So that was part of my strategy. Just show up every day. This is going to be hard. You're going to have to immerse yourself for about a year or two because the whole idea or statistic that we hear about most businesses don't make it past the first year is very, very oh, real. Yeah. Because yeah. financially and just stamina wise it is hard to get all these wheels on this big car going that's your business mm -hmm. using this you know like mm -hmm. analogy or whatever and and to get the car kind of moving forward and then to get the car on the street right. and then to make the car make a turn and then put it on a highway like it's a lot to get that going so i was just like i have to show up every day i have to be willing to learn i have to be willing to mess up and correct that mistake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to be willing to face that and to you know change myself, talk all of those things. But most importantly, I think that I can't really emphasize enough is the immersion. Yeah. The immersion to learn what I need to be able to do to run a business, which is the whole concept of this whole conversation right now is the things that you need to know as you're starting an adventure right. in business. Right. I think you. Um and, and, and super credit to you for, you know, deciding because to make this something that you would make successful. Because I think, like anything, I needed to demonstrate my commitment first. And then, and I guess, you know, we've been together for a while at that point. Like we've been together for almost two years Yeah. at that point. Definitely. Um, but you deciding, okay, I'm leaving my career, my previous career, and I'm going to commit to this. My third career. Right. I'm leaving my third career right. to become a business owner that I had never been before. I had never thought of before. Yeah. I mean, I think that there were, and this is kind of side note, I do think that there were moments within my previous careers that I knew that I would be the head of whatever, mm -hmm. or the director, or the chief executive officer, of whatever. Right. I knew that I would climb the ladder and kind of be in those positions, but I don't know that like 
and this is hindsight. Yeah. I don't know because now I see what Rare has become and what we've been able to do, and I'm just like, yo, I don't know that I ever saw myself running a creative agency. Right. I'm gonna be real with you. I did. I mean, I thank you because <laughs> I didn't see it. Um, but I would I think, say it to you all the time, but I think, um, you know, when you're starting a relationship, a romantic relationship, like sometimes you don't know what the, what someone's motive is for saying certain things. But I, but back to the the that part of your experience, I always wondered, you know, what because you you watched how I moved for a while. And how that impacted your comfort or decision making around, like, all right, I, I'm willing to take a shot. Here. Yeah. Um, or like, what things you know may have been a part of your thinking? There was a consistency that you had, and a support, and kind of that, like, you know, um, number one cheerleader. Like, I'm your number one fan. So I knew that taking the leap from, you know, okay, I'm going to pivot from my, you know, previous career, something that I had just recently switched into right. that I really loved. I knew that there was a ceiling on it though. And the amount of reading that I knew that you did, the amount of curiosity that you had, like, okay, well, I don't know the answer. I'm going to go find out. Right. I'm not going to be stuck with like not knowing or not having, you know, cause there's so many resources out there. There's so many free books and yeah. apps and, you know, articles, all different types of things, podcasts, YouTube that, you know, we are able to use. And so I saw you doing that on a consistent basis right. and also kind of being the, the number one person that was in my corner to look, this is something that you can do. It is it's possible. Right. Like it is possible because you hear people sometimes tell you, oh, yeah, go ahead. Like you know, all right, girl, like, I see you, or just, you know, and that's great, I need that too, but to come, from it, to be coming from you, and we were, you know, in the same house, we were, you know, still, in, you know, two years into our relationship, that made me feel comfortable. Right. With, like, going and, you know, making sure some stuff happened. Um, but with, with that being part of your business strategy, and then I kind of shared my business strategy, mm -hmm. was as a first-time entrepreneur, immerse myself. Yeah, right. Like, like head down, you can't be in the streets, and be at home working on your thing, because it takes... This concept that I've kind of come up with is that in order to make... Because Rare Label was a side thing for me for a minute. And I was like, in order to make Rare Label the thing that I do full time, I knew mm, that I needed to put full time effort into yeah, it. Yeah. So if you're not working, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna keep it, a, I'm gonna keep it a thousand. If you are not working on your business almost full time, like yeah. well, I'm talking thirty hours a week, and I know it's a lot. If you have a, a you know, a, a business or you know, a job right now that you're working in, it is going to be tough. But that's the immersion part of it. You are throwing yourself in the water. You're walking into the fire. There is no if, ands, or buts. There is no way around it. Right. So you have to put full time into the thing that you want to make full time. So that being a part of the business strategy. Yeah. I think that, that seems so daunting to people because they don't want to give up something in order to get something. But as soon as you give it up, you realize mm. that number one, maybe you didn't need it in the first place, or yeah. number two, you can actually go do it whenever you want, anyways. You have to You're give up. You're not really giving it up. Playing video games or going to the mall or like you know, you might have to give up a uh, Sunday dinner with the family, right? I'm not sure what it, you know what it is that you have to give up, but you can claim back chunks of time that you can reallocate towards the thing that you really want to build. And I think uh, from a lifestyle standpoint, you have to build a scenario where you can actually grow your business and grow yourself and not find that you're putting your time into Netflix or yeah. you're putting your time into, you know, like, oh, I have to do these sorts of things every week or, you know, I'm not It's like, no, you're going to have to give up that reallocate that time towards the other thing and that's how you get to 30 hours or whatever that number may or may not be i think ultimately um 
we develop lifestyle and lifestyle and lifestyles that support business and professional growth and personal, physical and psychological health. For me, that's always, I don't want to say always, um, it's become a thing that is, it just comes, kind of comes very naturally to how I move, regardless of where I am in the world. Um, but it was not always that way. And, and, and I think the largest point was, or the largest point is, that you can find other people who have done this over and over again in multiple industries that you can borrow their playbooks. Mm-hmm. You know, from their... Um, uh, yeah, I'm borrowing our playbooks. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't mind giving away my playbook because mm-hmm. it's going to be different. Even if I give you the playbook right now, you're probably going to look like... Um, unless you're already decided, you've already decided that you want to be a high flyer and high achiever, you're going to frown up at the playbook. And more importantly... Um, if you have already achieved something, something I'm probably going to learn and steal from you so I can continue to move my game up. Because even if I share my full playbook again today, it's going to be different in yeah. three months, if not six months, and definitely inside right. of... And you know, it's always yeah. evolving. Yeah, I absolutely. think that is another point of emphasis that we can make is as a first-time mm-hmm. entrepreneur or a you know second or third-time business owner, you probably already know this, but it's... Your business is always going to be evolving. So there's no moment where you're like, okay, I have everything figured out. It's cool. I can walk away and yeah. like, it's fine now. It's running itself. It's that, oh, it's always evolving. So yeah, every 30 days, if I need a new strategy every 30 days because I'm playing whatever game, right? right? Like social media, you might need a different strategy every 30 days on social media. On You, you might need a website or a, you know, just kind of a, evaluation of your company every six months maybe more than that just to continue moving the ball forward and things are changing so fast and technology is advancing so quickly so your business is going to be evolving um just to recap like really quick the three things that i think we've hit on so far like the the main things that you should know as a ceo is your problem solution and market your business expenses, like really what those hard costs the, are. The numbers overall, for sure. And then the third thing that we've addressed is strategy overall and roadmap. Like, what does this really look like? What is this road, you know, roadmap? All of that. And, and let me just give, give two examples of like roadmap, fi- financial roadmap, and um, uh, strategy in terms of time frame and and roadmap associated with that, like time, like how far out you need to plan and how far out you need to be thinking. So, I was we we had a uh, a talk that we did with some uh, kids the other day, mm-hmm. and uh, they asked like uh, how far out are you? Um, how far do you plan for like a music project? And you know, I'd be very honest with them. Like, I'm in June right now. The uh, project that 2021. yeah, 2021. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I feel behind because there are some some things I still want to kind of kind of cover. But like, it's important for us to be in June, July. You know what I mean? We need to be twenty four months ahead. And I'm like, damn, we're only eight. You know, we're only eight months ahead. Like, we need to be much further out than that. Uh, depending on people's atmospheres and environments, that may feel like you know a stretch. And I know good and well like people in the music business are used to chasing their tails and used to having day-to-day drama mm-hmm. as a creative person who works in multiple spaces I already know that that's a sign of total chaos you're never yeah. going to achieve what you could have achieved because you don't have proper planning and proper infrastructure uh, another example of like financial roadmap Bill Gates is notorious for having banked uh, 25 years of expenses or some crazy number like that for uh, Microsoft because he knew that the, the the advantage was not going to be being better than everybody sometimes it's going to be lasting longer than other people Right, right. and if you understand what just happened in that example I just broke down two things number one what the time frame looks like but also what the time frame looks like as it applies to your general strategy against the market how long can you endure before other people fall yes. out and sometimes that's the key to you winning yeah and i played that particular yeah. hand so many times because i know that people don't have the metal to sustain 
I'm going to play this game at this level and lose money for six months. And I'm going to make you have to raise your game. But the minute that you opt out, I'm going to be able to lower my expense bar. Now everybody's going to come to me because I'm the only player left. Really playing the long game. Yeah, man. Got to play the long game. And and <laughs> if you're listening to this and I did that to you and you didn't know it, congratulations. You you know, you got better today. But the, the, the trick overall has to be you identifying what the opportunities look like based on what the marketplace is who the competitors are, and whether or not you can achieve a first or second position in that market. Right. No, absolutely. Another thing that I'd like to add to things that I think, you know, is very important that you should familiarize yourself with is the importance of pitching. Mm. And pitching, I want to say that kind of lightly, that might not be the best way to describe it, but just approaching another business owner a pitch a potential partner um, someone who you want to work with or collaborate with Mm -hmm. knowing how to successfully pitch your idea so it's more formal than just calling somebody up or texting somebody like hey i have an idea right let's do it and the the parts about pitching that i want to emphasize is really being able to describe what you're talking about like have actual language keywords, Mm -hmm. things that, you know, phrases um, where you're able to really depict to someone who might be reading your pitch or reading your email, what you're trying to do. So having a solid overview of whatever it is, you know, it might be an event, it might be a product launch, Mm -hmm. it might be a virtual class, whatever this is, being able to really outline that in a few words, you know, whatever. Right. Another thing is focus in on what's in it for other people so when you're sending an email or you're pitching someone this might be in person or over the phone you've got a phone call like you've been able to at least get your foot in the door somewhere now you gotta sell your idea Mm -hmm. you have to make sure you know what's in it for somebody else because if it's only like oh well i'm doing this like help me with that people aren't necessarily as attracted to that because they're needing to hear, okay, well, what do I get out of this? If I put my time or my money into this person that's telling me this, you know, it's a wonderful idea, but I don't know what's in it for me. Right. So focus on that when you're giving you someone know, pitching. else homework. Yeah, right. Don't, yeah, don't give anybody else homework. <laughs> like, make it as easy as possible for them to, number one, give you their time, give you their money, support, whatever that looks like, but really be specific and, yo, this is what's in it for you. Da, 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 da. Whether it might be monetary, it might be relational, it might be, you know, just um, exposure, <laughs> like right. it, whatever it is. Like it's different for every every situation. Um, but really mm-hmm. being able to have an overview in that pitch, and then also what is in it for someone else. It is not right. always about me, 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 my business, my business, my business. I think to to want only a single comment there because I think you did a beautiful job of explaining like that as a. a a thing that people are seldomly doing that will have a large impact on the success that it could have if they began doing that. Yeah. Right. Um, right. But, you know, we are often trying to sell to companies that have it together. And if they have it together, me asking them like, oh, like, you know, what do y'all need? It's like, they don't need a... Nothing. <laughs> they winning. Yeah. What do you mean? Yep. So, for instance, can I chime no, in here? If, say, for you know, for whatever reason, you're asking for a collaboration between you and Nike. Right. Okay. Nike already has number one a lot of people knocking at their door. Mm-hmm. Number two, they already have an amazing creative team right. that is doing events across the globe. So, the point of a pitch is to bring them something that they have not seen before that they can understand within a few it's going this is going to be a presentation basically Mm -hmm. this is not a phone call this is not getting done in a text message or even an email this is a your formal your most formal pitch is going to obviously come in the form of a presentation Mm -hmm. you have to be able to put this down put your idea onto paper and make it so alluring or attractive to somebody that you're sending it to that they're going to be like, yes, I, maybe they just want to learn more. 
right. get that second phone call, get that reply email, get that whatever you need, and then go from there and continue to sell and like be okay with someone not responding or someone not liking your idea. <laughs> right. It's okay. Right. Um, so that's one thing that I want to make sure that definitely people walk away with is to figure out how to pitch your ideas mm. by not only you know having a, a super solid overview, but telling someone what's in it for them and, and being able to stand out. So if you send Nike a cold email, somebody at Nike or whatever, I don't know, a cold email, and it ain't got no presentation to it, it ain't got no document attached, there is no visual aesthetic, there is no language for the event mm -hmm. or the activation or the shoe colorway or whatever it is that you're trying to pitch to them, they are not thinking twice about it. Because I'm not Nike, but I know when I get emails and there's like, yo, I just wanna like, I wanna collab, I wanna see what you think about. You put more work on me. Mm -hmm. I already got work. Mm -hmm. So you do the work up front. Please do the work up front and then send your ideas off to people. Right. And you'll get more buy-in. They'll be like, oh, all I gotta do is like, yeah, because you already thought through what you need from that person and what they're gonna get out of it. Right. Tell them that and then they're gonna be like, oh, sign me up. How do I, you know, what, what's the next, when do we talk again? Right. You might have you might have to make several pitches and make several adjustments to that before it's even accepted, right? Yeah. And we go through that often, you know. I think the average number of times where we've pitched something for the first time and until we might actually, sometimes we don't get the deal at all. Mm -hmm. But the average amount of edits, pro it's probably three, two to three edits. Oh yeah, average, yeah. Average, average. yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, on, on the short side, you know, two, and it depends on the, the level or, or, or project type. And, and watch this, there are even scenarios where um, we don't get, a ch we don't have a chance to pitch, right? Because they may, um, uh, ask us to do something else just based on what they believe that we're capable of. Sure. So I think there's a, 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 a value to professionally putting your hat in the ring through a proper proposal. Yeah. Right. Because even when you come with that second proposal three Correct. or four months down the road, they're, they're still going to yeah remember, okay, like, and a proposal just allows someone to see that they take their idea seriously. They've mm -hmm. already thought through all of this. Yes, we might need some fine tuning and some, you know, there's always gonna be edits or adjustments or additions, but it's and like, oh, they already took the time out to actually put this form of, they, like, they ain't playing around. Right, there was a call I had yesterday we were talking about like, uh, uh, you know, things being shared in paper. And I know for you, like, that's a critical thing. And uh, the brother who I was talking about, talking with this about on yesterday, he was like, well, uh, my team knows that if something comes in uh, and they uh, and it's not on paper, that it's not going to get reviewed. You know, yep. you're not going to be able to tell me something that you know our company should be involved in, and then I go tell the leader of our firm. That leader is not going to even want to get on the phone with you. They want to see it on paper. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, one of the other things that we both agreed on, it seems to us to be a demonstration of rigor, mm -hmm. right? Or an example of your ability to kind of do hard things. And, right. You know, as I alluded to personally from the top of our conversation, like, Yo, that's critical for me. Yeah. And it's something that I will say, my kind of my role in our company, um, I am kind of facilitating some of those relationships and mm -hmm. connecting those dots with, okay, we mm -hmm. should work with this person or this business or this company and I will not send somebody an email unless we have something on a formal document. Now, I ain't talking PowerPoint. I'm not talking PowerPoint. <laughs> it needs to be a little bit more souped up than that yeah. because a lot of these big companies or whoever you're reaching out to, like, they're utilizing professional, professional software. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, PowerPoint is great, but it's not for, it's not necessarily built for, but anyways, that's another conversation. Yeah, but, certainly, certainly do what you can do, but sometimes you take it as far absolutely. as you can take it in order to put it in professional hands. It might just be a simple with. mood board. Correct. It might be, but try to dress it up in a way that is, you know, that is something that Nike would receive well. Apple would receive well. Target would receive well. Like, 
that you should be shooting for that and then um, you know and then be prepared to adjust your pitch or be prepared to talk it through a little bit more and one last thing before we kind of close up this point a lot of times and I've had several conversations with with a lot of creative people who I know don't have rigor and it's a really uh, it's important for me never to tell them that they don't and they're not demonstrating what I think will help them be successful because there are uh, certain cases where somebody can go into a room with someone and tell them what it is and get pushed through. Right? So th there are some phone calls that I can make that you can't make that will get a quick yes. Right? And not you. but Right? But if it's that kind of a deal, then it's probably not a deal that's going to move the ball forward for us because we're not that high up on the totem pole. Right? I mean, I can't make a call to the president of global sales at Nike and go like, hey, um, so-and-so, I want to do this thing with Zion, uh, but it's going to cost 30000 You already know our style. Yeah. It'll be great, blah, blah, blah. And we have a track record that we can leverage as a proxy for the lack of pitch right? so that, that person can move in transaction. Take that idea that that is happening for some people can make that call, sure. but they have a backlog of transactions in history with that person. So they know what they're capable of. So it can be a phone call for them. Don't approach whatever possible deal that you want to get into with the same idea that, oh, all so-and-so did, da, 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 and yeah. that's what, how they got the deal done. Well, you're not them. You haven't laid that type of right. framework. You don't have that type of advantage and that type of momentum available to you you got to think much more humbly and go in, humbly and go into that scenario with That's hey point. you know this i worked on this it's like this this is all i got yeah. you know i believe this would be great to you and give them the pitch that they deserve because they don't owe you a goddamn thing yeah. so don't That's take a point. privileged idea that you borrow from somebody else more accomplished as a as a, as a reason for you to be lazy that you borrowed somebody else more accomplished yeah and then that makes you give gives you a chance to be lazy yeah no lazy no shortcuts i think um to recap just one more time we might have one more point but know your problem your solution in your market understand your hard business expenses yeah have a business strategy and a roadmap a timeline of you know, know that you're going to be immersed for a year or two on certain projects. Think ahead. Yeah. And then lastly, we just wrapped up being able to pitch appropriately and tell somebody else what's in it for them, why they should come to your event, why they should send you $30,000 to do a project with Zion, why they should fly you out to f photograph something. Like, tell somebody else what's in it for them. Pitch, mm -hmm. pitch, pitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there one more thing that you think of that you're like, yo, if I could let, you know, you, I know that you've started, um, you know, several, you own several businesses, you have started a lot of projects. Is there anything else that you're like, yo, as a CEO, I don't care if you're 20 years old, if you 40, if you 10 projects in, if this is your first one, know these, know these things, know this thing. Hmm. Well, let me answer that in a, in a, uh, in a different way. So f for me, I've been up, down, left, right, you know, yeah, all of that. And th the thing that I deeply believe in is personal integrity and facing the music. You know, you are going to lose money you are going to miss ideas. You are going to, you're just going to have fail. You're going to have feedback that you don't like. You're going to be dismissed. You're going to be received and praised. Like you're going to have so many different. Yeah. You're going to fall down. You're going to lose friends. You're going to have lonely nights or days or weeks or, you know. And here's the point even that you made to like to, to losing friends. If, 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 and I don't want to go too far down that path, but like if you're losing friends, like who are the friends and why and all of that. And I think that's a whole, a whole talk in and of itself. But I'll say this, like if you have investors and you 
lose or have lost their money and all the rest of that. Now you don't want to answer the phone. Face it. Answer the face it, yo. Either you are going to do the right thing and figure out what you can do to return the money, right? And you stay full transparent and you stay in the fight. Uh, but more importantly, you try to frame why or if you need investors' money to begin with. Yeah. Like, I'm very bullish on not taking people's money, right. right? I just try not to play with investment. So, like, recently I got tied into a scenario that I didn't ask for, but it is what it is. Take care of the people. Yeah. Face it. Face it. There's no benefit to you crying about a scenario or pointing the finger to somebody else when whatever deal you're in is your responsibility. So I don't have anything to say about it other than like, hey, here's my next set of plans. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to move. Right. right? Or if there's a scenario where you have a position, a particular position in a certain firm or in a certain organization or in a business deal, and then that position shifts, right? Say you're no longer needed for job X and somebody else that, that is inside of the fold takes on the responsibility that was initially assigned to you. Do you get an attitude because it's like, no, figure out what else you can do. Yeah. Right? You're no longer needed to score. Now go, go defend. Right? It's, it's choosing how to be useful no matter what scenario or what hand you have in, in your business or in partnerships. And that would be my main thing. Like, figure out how to have a positive, forward-thinking, offensive mindset. Right. Because that's going to have everything to do with whether or not you can and will be successful. Because you're going to get your ass kicked. And you're not going to get the feedback that you want all the time. Right. So that's... In a whole, the last point, and I think that that's knowing that you're going to fail. Yeah. Like every CEO should know you are going to fail. Mm -hmm. You're going to possibly, probably, most definitely owe somebody money at some point yeah. because they invested. Okay, cool. Um, you're going to want to always still continue to pick, the, pick up those phone calls, continue that relationship, you know, be useful. That was a great, great word. Mm -hmm. Find ways to be useful through your failure. Um, own your failure, face it, face the music, and right. continue to work, just continue to show up. Um, this entrepreneurship journey or starting a business does not come without failure. And that's right. a part of it. It's, it's not a matter of if, it is when and how big. And sometimes you're going to fail and it's not going to be a big deal. It's going to be like, okay, like I messed up that social media post. Right. I can go edit the caption. Sometimes right. you're going to fail and it's going to be like, dang, like I literally lost somebody's $20,000. Like, right. Shit. <laughs> right. And, so and, don't, and in those scenarios, don't worry, like, it's gonna come. Th there should be professional pre talk that has everything uh, contractually stated. Contracts. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a whole other bag, right? So you got, you have that, you have responsible investing. So who your investors are. So, like, you want to think about how you play the, the, the debt role, whether that is getting money from your family to help start your businesses, right? Do because if you get in business with the boogeyman, right, and you watch everything that's ever been written about, like you know, going to the devil and asking a favor from the devil and being afa afraid of what the cost of it is, like you got to be aware of that, right? Yeah. The, the the difference between businesses like uh, that have venture capital, venture backed companies, or whatever, they have money to lose and intentionally get into playing ball. For, with the idea, with the understanding that there's a high probability that they're going to lose their money. So if you take money from somebody who is giving you their last, that's not an investor that you should be playing ball with. Right. And again, this that whole that's a whole other conversation. But yeah. uh, investing as an investor, you should also know that your responsibility is to not give your last, right? And to give the entrepreneur that you're supporting every resource that you possibly can provide for them in order for them to be successful. So if you create an environment where you are leveraging intimidation, which I'd never do that with anything I'm investing in. I never go to the entrepreneur and be like, yo, you told me that's why and Z because I understand what it is as a business owner and as an entrepreneur, like what the hand is that to deal with and I pre-vetted who this person is on the front side. So I want to go, okay, dude, I know you're struggling. Let's talk about it. Like, How can we help you get 
to right. the other side of this. So are, you're saying kind of if you are investing or you're accepting investments from kind of the right people, you've Correct. gotten those real relationships that the investor, they in a sense should understand that there might be hiccups, like let's right. continue to talk and work. Because a good this, investor, like, like, and I've done this several times where like I'm investing in something and then it's going the wrong way and I'm going, okay, do I need to put more money in in order to make it work? Sure. And again, if you're looking, if you're if you're tapping into the right investors, and uh, you are a responsible investor, you're going to understand all 360 degrees or all sides of the argument and how to kind of approach getting into a winning business because it's not a straight line, and you need to be in a feedback loop at least among the decision making and the finance group to figure out what the hell needs to happen or not. Sure. And one of the biggest mistakes is the person with the money. Is making the decisions and when you when I'm in scenarios like that I'm very very skeptical of the success because that's oftentimes the person who has the least amount of education whole nother conversation Ooh. okay well that is a whole nother conversation we I think we covered a lot of really really dope points yeah so to wrap it up officially we spoke about being able to determine what the problem is that you solve the solution that you provide the marketplace that you're in, yeah. being able to track those trends, know who your competitors are. The second thing was having um, a clear understanding of your business expenses. What is this going to cost me per month, per mm -hmm. quarter, per year to really get this thing going mm -hmm. and in the way that you need it to go? And the next thing, I think number three, was business strategy. Yeah. Like be clear on like the why, the, the long run, think ahead. If you can think a year in advance, 18 months, 24, really do that. Like, not just like, oh, in five years I want to be here, yeah. but like being able to strategize each month what you're going to do to get there in five years. So business strategy is super important. We talked about the importance of pitching, being able to send somebody an email or send some, you know, over the phone, present something. You got Google Meet, you got Zoom, you can right. share screen, having a pitch that is developed that is designed and selling someone on your idea by telling them what's in it for them right and then lastly but not least i think this is you know one of my favorites something that i had to come to terms with was you are going to fail you're going to lose money you're going to hiccup you're going to you're mm -hmm. going to mess some shit up you got to understand your math so I think that was that was five or six things. We'll recap those in the notes. Sure. And the, 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 the point that I made about the person with the money oftentimes is the least educated. That can also be the case for investors, which is why they're investing. But the best investors are people who also understand the space. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And if you like with Rare Label, there are no other investors. It's only me and only Jordan. Like we don't have any other outside investors. And the reason for that is, is because we needed to be able to control the narrative for the bet. So I know I'm making a six figure bet and inside of a six figure bet, if it doesn't come back in six months or a year or whatever it is that you told an investor, and you start to get down with pressure or you're making decisions that you have to qualify to somebody else that could restrict your ability to kind of move around. So ultimately, you are your own investor, your own bank, and you have deep understanding. Sure. Right? So just have, having some money does not make you dumb. I want to make sure that I'm clear about the difference. Can you clarify? But, but sometimes, you know, again, having money doesn't make you smart. Yeah. Well, thank y'all for watching. And yeah, I mean, we're just hoping that you left away with best practices, applications, some systems yeah. to really spark your creative approach as you scale your business as you pivot whatever it is that you're doing yeah. um, you can reach out to us our website is rarelabel.com it's r-a-i-r-e label.com info at rarelabel.com if you want to shoot us an email or a pitch okay okay yeah. I got you and um, our social media personally I am Jordan Ray I am Rashad Tyler you are not Rashad I am Rashad Tyler on Instagram no oh you're right no, Instagram. you're right. My, I mean, my name is Rashad Tyler, but whatever, whatever, Rashad, we're saying, whatever we're saying, whatever we're saying, I'm going to put it somewhere on the screen anyway. Um, but 
it's at Rashad Tyler on virtually every platform. For sure. Again, thank you and stay sharp, y'all. Bye.